When I was an undergrad, I said there's no way I'm gonna let some stupid test get in the way of me and my dream to become a doctor. Hello friends, my name is Darren and I'm an upper year medical student at McMaster University. When I was writing the MCAT, surprise surprise, I found the car section to be the most difficult out of the four. That being said, I've decided to make this video which outlines all the information I possibly have on how I moved from the 50th to the 93rd percentile the first time I wrote the MCAT. Today, we're going to be talking about the resources that are most similar to the AMC, how to practice, the strategy that I personally found most effective, what traps to avoid, the mindsets that are going to set you up for success, and we're starting right now. In terms of resources, I remember being like, whoa, okay, like there's just too many resources out there, like too much information, like I don't know what to focus on, what's good, what's not good. But after browsing through countless hours of Reddit and talking to my upper year friends, I started realizing, okay, there's like four key resources that most people seem to recommend. One is the AMC content itself, like anything from them is gold because this test is all about thinking like the AMC, not necessarily thinking like a normal person thinks so the more you can expose yourself to their material and the more you can think like them the better off you're gonna be on test day I personally did everything from them twice and I know there's the fear that okay like what if I just remember the passages but by leaving I think I left about two to three months in between these repetitions I wasn't really able to remember any significant details and maybe that's just my like bad memory but I really think that if you leave enough time in between it's not really gonna significantly alter uh, your comprehension of the passage the second time. Besides the AMC practice exams, you got Khan Academy, which makes sense because, well, the AMC helped make those questions as well. Uh, and they also have like nice little like those little cool sounds when you get the question right, so that's kind of nice. Um, the, you have the Princeton Review, Cars Workbook, and Exam Crackers 101 Passages in Verbal Reasoning. I also did other stuff like Next Steps 108 Passages in Cars. I would focus more of my time on those upper four resources in that order. Links to those resources in the description below if you want to pick any of those up for your own practice. Practice? We're talking about practice, man. So I remember people kept telling me, practice, practice, practice. And it's like, okay, I get it. You can't study for this section of the test. You just have to practice. But at the same time, no one would tell me, how do you actually practice? Like, I ain't paying for a tutor. <laughs> Man's are broke. What do you mean? The way I see it, there are two key principles that are going to make sure you get the best score you can get on the car section of the MCAT. The first is speed, and the second is understanding. So if you think about speed, like a ladder where the different rungs are you going up and shaving off 10 seconds here, 15 seconds there, 30 seconds there, then understanding is kind of like the ground that the ladder is actually resting on. When I first started practicing for the car section, it was normal for me to spend like 15 minutes or even just do passages on time just to make sure I had that foundational understanding of what the passage was actually talking about and to get my mind used to focusing on an extremely boring topic. And then as I got closer and closer to test date, that's when I started shaving off time and getting down to that eight to nine minutes of passage that I was aiming for on test day. One of the biggest mistakes I made in my early preparation was just being too casual about these cars passages. Like sometimes I knew it was boring, but I'd find myself with one hand on my face and leaning forward and I'd be like, okay, so the author's arguing about what, what now? No, Darren, wake up. I started to realize my brain is like a muscle and well, I wouldn't expect to get any bigger muscles by going to the gym and casually lifting weights. Once I started bringing that same intensity that I would expect out of myself on test day to each individual cars passage that I was doing, that's when I started to see my score going up and up and up. So it's like, okay, I'd give my all to each and every one of these car sections, but at the same time, I had to realize that 90% of the learning still hasn't happened yet. Approaching revision is such a key concept to understand if you want to improve your car score. Because for me, and I'm not saying this is gonna be the same timeline that you guys follow, but if I was doing a 90 minute car section, it was normal for me to spend three to four hours 
just reviewing the answer options, reviewing those explanations to see not only why the correct answer was correct, but I really wanted to be able to know why every other answer option was wrong. That was slowly building up that muscle of intuition that allowed me on test day to be like, okay, like I see answer A, like that looks like a wrong answer. I don't have the time right now to verbalize to myself exactly why it's wrong, but I've been able to pick up these patterns by going in and really spending a lot of the time reviewing and revising my way of thinking to align myself with the AMC's line of thought. Guys, everything I just told you is like 70% of what you need to know. We're gonna talk about strategy, don't get me wrong. I, I would be lying if I told you guys that there weren't some strategies that I found really helpful and other strategies that I found completely garbage, but no strategy is going to save you if you're not bringing that game time intensity to each practice passage you do and reviewing those answer options like a madman after you finish those practice passages. Ignore vague terms because they're only there to throw you off. I realized pretty quickly that I didn't actually have to know any term that wasn't written in plain English or wasn't defined by the text itself. So just to really hammer this point home, I'm gonna put a short paragraph on the screen for you guys. Don't worry, it's not a full passage, it's just a short paragraph, but I really recommend pausing the video and seeing if you can identify where the distractor is. Then we'll chat about it. All right, so go ahead and pause the video before this counter runs down and see if you can pull the main idea from the paragraph and identify the distractor. So you guys got this, like, what does churlish mean? I don't know, does it matter? No! The whole idea of that paragraph is just to describe the benefits of positive emotions on our mental and physical health, as well as telling us that these positive emotions are relatively contagious within social circles, like that's all. Like I could probably just put a big X or, you know, replace that word churlish with bambalaya and still get that same idea. Don't you dare look back at that passage unless you know exactly what you're looking for and where to find it. So, how do you keep track of all those obscure little details and still find the author's tone in the main idea of the passage? Strategic highlighting. I found this set of rules to be a good balance between not highlighting anything at all and just highlighting whatever I thought was important, which was usually way too much. So, any obscure detail like a place, a name of a person, a date, I highlighted for quick reference if you know, a question asked me to go back and find that information, I had it. Um, also, I highlighted very opinionated words like always, never, absurd. Those are the types of words that help you keep track of the author's tone, really pay attention to what comes after that. But also the more subtle transition words like but, however, therefore. And if you think about it, that's how we communicate usually anyways. For example, if I said, Pain is temporary, but GPA is forever. The underlying tone of what I'm trying to say, the underlying message I'm trying to send, well, it comes after the but. Not that kind of but, you sicko, but you get the point. Obscure details, opinionated words, and subtle transition words, those are the only three categories of things that I highlighted, and I found that to be the best way to make use of that tool on the actual exam. So I remember being two weeks out from my MCAT and I looked at my car score and I said, whoa, like I need to go up three points in the next two weeks if I wanna hit my target score. I called my friend, explained to him the situation and he was like, Darren, it sounds like you're doing everything right. The only thing I would add is just try and summarize each sentence in your head as you're reading it. As soon as he said that, I was like, whoa, like, that sounds crazy. But as I started doing it, I was like, oh, like, this is the difference between active and passive reading that everyone keeps telling me about. They just haven't described the cognitive process of what actually goes on when you're doing it. Think about a piano player who's, who plays the melody with his right hand and plays the chords with his left hand too like related but not necessarily identical activities. So with one side of my brain, I'm looking at that car's passage and I'm reading the words on the page, getting that information into my head. 
With the other side of my brain, I'm saying, okay, like, how can I put this in my own words? Okay, I got it. That's what the author is trying to say. Where do I disagree? And where do I agree with what the author is saying? That simultaneous cognitive process of taking in the information and summarizing it in my own words as I'm reading it is the process of active listening. I found that as I started actively reading like this, I was better able to find the main idea of each paragraph and then obviously the main idea of the entire passage at the end, which I would also stop and summarize in my head uh, every single time. I'm not saying that it's going to improve your score three points like it did mine in two weeks, but out of all the strategies that I talked about in this video, I would say that that's probably the one strategy that I would recommend trying first because it made such a big difference in my own understanding of how to tackle this car section. Unfortunately, I think there's a fair amount of traps that exist and it really sucks to say but the test prep companies probably put them out there because they know that it's easier to sell a fancy sounding strategy than it is to sell the fact that this is just a difficult section that requires a decent amount of work to actually get good at. Things like reading the questions first, skipping around to find the easier passages and flip-flopping between the answers and the questions and the passage itself. I didn't find those helpful. I had to think about it like this. All that extra time that I was spending clicking and scrolling and going back and forth, it's like, okay, that's taking away from time that I need to actually sit there and understand the main idea of the passage and answer the questions based on that information. Most of the people I talked to that got those 130, 131, 132 that you guys are all aiming for, they didn't do anything fancy like that. They just wrote the test like it was meant to be written. They read the passage and then they answered the questions in order. Guys, you gotta trust yourself. Trust that all the work that you've put in in the weeks leading up to the exam are going to pay off on test day. When you answer a question, I want you to answer it with confidence. If you're really, really, really unsure, yeah, flag it and come back to it at the end. But for the most part, the MCAT, especially the car section, is not a test that you can afford to be second guessing yourself for every other question. It just doesn't work that way. In between passages, you're gonna have to find a way to prevent your mind from wandering and thinking about the previous passage and all the questions that you maybe got wrong, which you probably didn't get wrong because usually your first answer is your best answer. The technique that I found most helpful to clear my mind in between passages is called belly breathing. You take a deep breath all the way down to your belly and you breathe out through pursed lips. Let's do it together. I actually learned during medical school that this meditative technique is actually really good for you because it's scientifically proven to lower your blood pressure, reduce your levels of stress, and help give you that mental clarity that you need to forget about the previous passage and focus on the task at hand. I also do recommend that you guys practice meditating if you haven't already because, you know, 10 to 15 minutes a day of focusing on the air moving in and out of your nostrils is pretty boring and if you can focus on that for 10 to 15 minutes, then reading some passage about classic literature, that's gonna be a walk in the park. Thanks for watching guys. Here's a playlist to help improve your MCAT scores and help you get into medical school.